make sure this thing is off because if it rings, it's a dragnet thing. So, add a little drama to what we're doing up here, right? It is uh, good to be here. I want to thank Greg for the invitation. Um, I'm assuming that everybody here knows Greg and knows his story. If you don't, uh, his testimony is a powerful one. I've had the opportunity to to speak at one of his events before and then have him uh, share his testimony on my podcast. Uh, and uh, it's just great to see what God is doing in his life. It's great to see this event. Uh, welcome for those of you who are here, those of you who are watching live uh, or will be watching the playback of this thing. Uh, it's good to see my friend Jazzy Jeff Bright back in the background. I just found out... I just found out a little while ago that Jazzy is uh, running for public office. He just made that announcement, and, and from what I'm told, Riley, he's running unopposed, right? One, one time, this, this is a true story. In the eighth grade, a buddy of mine and I entered a social studies fair, right? We were the only people in that particular category, and we finished second. So it, it's a true story because you had to score a certain number of points in the judging to get to the next level to win first place and go to the state level. We didn't get there. So, Jazzy, just it, it is possible to lose as the only person running <laughs> in a category. Yeah, I, I understand. You're talking about a guy here who once tripped going up an escalator and fell down the stairs for an hour and a half. So, anyway. Um, before we get going here, just to share a little bit about what's going on with me. Uh, Greg mentioned the, the director of Grand Slam Ministries. That is as fledgling, a fledgling nonprofit as you can be. I literally filed the online 501c3 form about three weeks ago. And, and the purpose of Grand Slam Ministries is, is going to be really threefold. Number one, I feel like God is calling me into a, a radio ministry that I'm going to use the, um, the uh, nonprofit as a way to support so we can buy time and get on stations uh, across the country. We are going to use the uh, nonprofit as a way to mentor men to be better husbands and fathers, to help in, in every aspect of life because at our church at Utica Baptist, there were a number of men who poured into me when I first got saved and I was without a job and I just want to take that and pay it forward. And then the other thing that we're hoping to do with it is, I don't know if you folks are aware of this, but there are children in these communities, when they go home from school on Friday, many of them don't eat again until they come, home on, come back to school on Monday. So what we want to do is find a way to help. There are different schools and organizations who do weekend backpack programs, that is going to be one of the other missions, kind of a threefold mission of what we're going to do. Grand Slam Ministries, the SLAM, once we finally get a logo, the SLAM is going to be an acronym for Serve, Love, and Mentor. So just pray for us where that is concerned. When I got asked to speak at the leadership conference, I thought, well, I'm going to be, it's like having the opening act to Led Zeppelin. All the great guys are coming later on. And, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of the guy that is going to be here to either warm up or, or you know, people are going to start throwing things to get this bum off the stage and let's get Riley up here or David Shirley later on, some of the other guys. But when I thought about leadership, it, it's something that affects every Every church, every denomination, nobody is, is immune from leadership issues. In fact, have you heard about the one that's kind of permeating its way through the entire church world right now? Have you heard about this squirrel problem we're having? And it started at the Presbyterian church. The, the church leaders called a meeting to decide what to do about a squirrel infestation that they had. And after much prayer and consideration, they concluded that the squirrels were, the squirrels were predestined to be there so they shouldn't interfere with God's divine will. Down the road at the Baptist church, the squirrels had taken an interest in the baptistry. So the deacons met. They decided to put a water slide on the baptistry and let the squirrels drown themselves. Well, what they found out was the squirrels liked the slide and unfortunately instinctively knew how to swim. So the next week, twice as many squirrels showed up. 
the Lutheran church decided they were not in a position to harm any of God's creatures, so they humanely trapped their squirrels and set them free near the Baptist church. Two weeks later, the squirrels were back when the Baptists took down the water slide. The Episcopalians, well, they tried a much more unique path by setting out pans of whiskey around their church in an effort to kill the squirrels with alcohol poisoning, but unfortunately they found out how much damage a band of drunken squirrels can do. But it was the Catholic Church that came up with the most creative strategy. They baptized all the squirrels and made them members of the church, so now they only see them at Christmas and Easter. And then not much was heard out of the Jewish synagogue. They took the first squirrel, the first squirrel they found and circumcised them. They haven't seen one since. Oh, mercy. In uh, my few minutes this morning, I'm going to stick to the one thing that I'm supposed to know something about as a broadcaster, and that's communication. And more specifically, what Jesus taught us about how to communicate in business, in family, in the church, in every aspect of our lives. And since Easter is rapidly approaching, I want to use a Bible text this morning that's appropriate. So if you have a Bible with you, you can open up to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to be focusing on verses 13 through 35. It's the story of Jesus meeting the two men on the road to Emmaus. And as we get into this this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit will allow us to see three things. First of all, Jesus joins the conversation. Secondly, Jesus listens to the conversation. And then finally, Jesus changes the conversation. So starting in verses 13 through 17, this is Luke 24, verses 13 through 17, it says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But verse 16 says, Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And the two men, the Bible says, stood still looking sad. So to put into context where we are here, the first 12 verses of Luke 24 tells us about the account of the discovery of the empty tomb. Jesus had been hung on the cross, he had died, he had been resurrected, and now here, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women going to the tomb with spices to anoint the body. They don't know that he's been resurrected. And upon their arrival, they find the stone rolled away from the tomb, from the opening. The tomb is empty, and there are two men, angels, standing there. King James Version says they're in shining garments. The ESV says dazzling apparel. Obviously, it was something that was going to catch their attention. And remember what the angels said in verses 5 through 7. As they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. I love that. Why do you seek the living among the dead? So Luke goes on to tell us that the women ran back to the 11 disciples, told them what happened, and what was the disciples' reaction? They didn't believe them at first. But then Peter, and as we know from his gospel, John ran to the tomb and found it empty. They saw the burial clothes of Jesus in the tomb, but they didn't see Jesus there because he wasn't there. So that's the background that leads us to where we are in this conversation today. These two men are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey. They're sad, they're confused, they're frightened, they're disappointed. And then suddenly this stranger joins them on their journey. And again, Jesus, who they don't recognize, in effect, we're in the south, right? In effect, he walks up to him and says, hey, 
What y'all talking about? Jesus joins the conversation. Second point, Jesus listens to the conversation. Verses 18 through 24. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. And moreover, some women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Verse 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So Jesus, after he asks them what they're talking about, he steps back and he listens. He lets them say their piece. David Guzik is a wonderful Bible commentator. And he says that Jesus opened the conversation by asking them what they were talking about. And from this, we can know that he had walked silently with them for a while, just listening as they carried on the conversation. He could see that they were sad. He could see that they were confused. But Guzik said that Jesus knew what they knew already, that they were sad. And he knew what they did not yet know, that they had no reason to be sad. And I, I'm one who thinks that God has a little bit of a sense of humor sometimes. Because these men ask Jesus, are you the only one who doesn't know what's happened in Jerusalem? To Jesus, who had been nailed to the cross and had died. And yet Jesus had a pretty good idea what had happened in Jerusalem, hadn't he? But he asked, what things? And, and Guzik says that in saying this, he skillfully played along with the conversation. And in doing so, he encouraged these men to reveal their hearts. And even though he knew their hearts already, there's a value in saying those things to God. There's a value for those men in sharing those things with Jesus. And then Guzik went on to point out what the men told Jesus. Again, they don't recognize him, but this is what they knew about Jesus. They knew his name and where he was from. They knew he was a prophet. They knew he was mighty in deed and word. They knew he had been crucified. They knew he had promised to redeem Israel, and they knew that others said he had risen from the dead. Now, it's important to note here that chief among all these things was their disappointment that in their eyes, anyway, Jesus had not fulfilled his promise to redeem Israel. But we have to ask the question, what kind of redemption were they looking for at that moment in time? Well, they were looking for somebody to overthrow the Roman government. And they didn't yet understand that the redemption of Israel and all of humanity was the redemption of their sins through the perfect sacrifice of the death on the cross that Jesus had just suffered. So Jesus joins the conversation, he listens to the conversation, and now we get a little theology. Jesus changes the conversation, verses 25 through 35. I'll read this quickly. Verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Verse 31, 
and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did our hearts, or did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they found the eleven. They rose that same hour, returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. You know, there's never been a better better Bible teacher than Jesus himself because under the authority of the Holy Spirit, he authored it. And I love verse 27 where it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he showed them all the scriptures in the Old Testament that revealed who he was at that moment in time. And, And yet these men still didn't get it. And they didn't recognize Jesus until at the home of one of the men, he blessed the bread, broke it, and gave it to them. And then verse 31 says, then their eyes were opened. They were spiritually blind up to that point, but then their eyes were opened. They finally recognized it was Jesus who had been walking with them, who had been talking to them, listening to them, teaching them, and then suddenly he was gone. And what did the men do? Verse 33 says they rose that same hour. They hightailed it back to Jerusalem to find the disciples and the others and shared their experience with the risen Christ. Now, folks, a seven-mile journey at that time was not something that you just did on a whim, especially at night. It had taken them a long time to walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. I'm going to guess, though, that their spirits were a little higher, their countenance was a little better. I'm thinking they probably made a little bit better time back to Jerusalem. What about you? So that's the backdrop. Jesus joins the conversation. Jesus listens to the conversation. Jesus changed the conversation. So here are a couple of questions for us to consider today. How well do we really communicate? And for those of us who are Christians, knowing what we are commanded to do and knowing our own salvation story, are we sharing that experience with others? You know, in the early stages of the pandemic, I saw a report that three major evangelical organizations, including Billy Graham's, reported a significant rise in interest on their websites from people who were wanting to know more about Jesus. God was and still is using this worldwide emergency to slow us down and draw people closer to it. The question is, how are we responding to it? We look around, we see so much anger, we see so much pain, so much hate. Satan has his hooks in every single fabric of our society today. And if you read the Bible, you know it's only going to get worse, it's not going to get better. And yet those of us who are Christians, folks, we have the answer. We have the cure for what ails the world. We have the cure for what is crippling society. We have the cure for the sin that's running rampant in the lives of men and women everywhere, including right here in our own backyard. Oconee County, Pickens County, Greenville, Spartanburg, Newry, Jazzy Jeff. But are we sharing it? How well are we communicating it? And look, I have to ask myself the same question, and if I'm being honest, the answer is not nearly enough. For whatever reason, many of us as Christians aren't sharing the good news of Jesus Christ often enough or in a way that's effective enough to bring the lost to the cross. And there are a lot of reasons why. For me, I have no trouble standing in front of large groups sharing my faith. I have no trouble telling my salvation story how God pursued me and began removing things from my life that were standing between him and me. I have no trouble talking about my failings 
my drinking, my battle with pornography, the physical and emotional cheating on my wife, the hurt that it caused her and my kids, and the fact that it almost cost me my family, everything and everyone that I love. I'll stand up in front of crowds, big and small, and share the miracle that Jesus did in my life every time I'm asked to do it, and I love doing it. But you get me in a one-on-one -on -one situation, and I'm not nearly as comfortable doing that. And, and I'm just bearing my soul here, folks. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and, and you know, I've tried to analyze why. I've been plagued with insecurity most of my life. Maybe that's part of it. Feeling of inadequacy, I, I don't really know. But I pray for God to give me the confidence in those one-on-one -on -one conversations that I have in situations like this. Speaking here at this conference today. And, and think about it. Jesus spoke so eloquently and with so much authority when he taught in the synagogue or on the Sermon on the Mount. He commanded the crowds. They followed him everywhere. But you know, his best messages were one-on-one. -on -one. His encounter with Nicodemus, the woman at the well, which, by the way, is a textbook play-by-play -play account, or maybe the playbook, I should say, for how to handle racial relations. That's an aside. You can have that for free. The possessed man who lived among the tombs, or the woman taken in adultery. There was a large crowd at the beginning, but it ended up just being him and her. All of these were individual conversations powerful moments between Jesus and another person. Men and women, I want that power. I, I want that confidence. And we should all want it. And we should all pray for it. We need to pray for God to bring opportunities to witness into our lives and then trust that He will provide not only the words, but the strength and the courage to act when the Holy Spirit prompts us to act. So what's the application for us today here at the Golden Corner Leadership Conference? Jesus couldn't change the conversation that he had with those two men on the road to Emmaus until he did what? Until he joined it. And then he listened to what they had to say. We have to be willing to join a lot of uncomfortable conversations today whether it's about racial injustice, social upheaval, or political unrest. We can't have a positive effect on any of these issues unless we're willing to join that conversation. But then when we join it, we must be willing to listen. Way too often... When we do engage someone on one of these subjects, we want to be quick to give our opinion, or in the talk radio world, we call it our take. And then we want to throw some Bible at them. And if we're not careful, we come off looking very much like the Pharisees. And we all know what Jesus' opinion was of that bunch. But if we're willing to join the conversation, not only join the conversation, but to honestly and intently listen to what the other person is saying, the Holy Spirit will direct our next move. Now, as my pastor says, don't hear what I'm not saying. Listening doesn't mean that you agree or condone. But it gives you a chance to find out where the other person is coming from. And most of the time, anyway, it will make them more receptive to listening to what you have to say. And many of these conversations are going to come with people that you already know. You already have some kind of relationship with them. And others will come with complete strangers, sometimes face-to-face, -face, sometimes through Facebook, don't get me started, <laughs> or other social media outlets. But however these conversations come, we as Christians must be willing 
to join and listen before we can affect change. Otherwise, you're just arguing. And that's not going to lead anybody to Christ. And you know, really, we're not the ones who affect the change anyway. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But God uses you. He uses me to plant the seed. That's our job. And then the Holy Spirit's the one who changes hearts and reaps the harvest. But only if we're willing to obey His prompting and get involved in conversations that are, in many cases, very, very uncomfortable. But aren't you glad that when Jesus ascended back to heaven, He sent the Comforter? He's with us. He'll guide us. He will strengthen and equip us if we'll just get out of the way and let Him work. So if you're here today or you're watching this and you're a Christian, my prayer for you is the same as for myself, that God puts you in a position to have these kind of conversations and that you surrender to his will and allow the Holy Spirit to lead. If you're here today or watching and you're not a Christian, then my prayer is that something that either I've said or you will hear throughout the rest of this conference Or some conversation that you'll have with a Christian in the very near future will open your eyes and your heart to the fact that Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again on the third day. And right now he sits on the right hand of the Father in heaven. Advocating for you. Pleading with you to come to the cross and accept the free gift of salvation that he offers. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. Jesus took care of it all through his death, burial, and resurrection. All you have to do is accept him and believe in him, and not just intellectually, but through faith. Faith that he is who he claimed to be, the son of the living God, as those men on the road to Emmaus finally found out. Jesus gave us the blueprint for salvation, He gave us the blueprint for communication. And the question I'll leave with you today is, are we ready to follow those blueprints? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have of coming to you in prayer. Thank you for your word, which gives us such great insight into so many of the things that we have to deal with virtually everything that we have to deal with. And for this story about Jesus on the road with these two men from Emmaus and, and teaching us as, as Christians in general and, and, and perhaps leaders who are to follow me today and specifically about how to effectively communicate. He joined the conversation. He listened to the conversation, and only then did he change the conversation. Help us to have that mindset, to be willing to join, and even more so to listen. We don't have to agree. But we're not going to win any souls to the cross by arguing. And I just pray that 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 fact will become very, very apparent to all of us who claim the promise of Jesus Christ as our Savior as we move forward. Bless the rest of these speakers. Bless this conference. Thank you for Greg and and his faithfulness in putting this together. And everything we accomplish will give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You see me exit. It's not that... It's a hit and run type of thing. I, I told Greg when he asked me to do this a couple of months ago that I, was, I would be, uh, I think in the recruiting world, they call it a soft commitment uh, because, as Greg told you, I broadcast Furman basketball, and at the time, I did not know when we were going to be playing in the Southern Conference Tournament. Our first game is today. It's fortunately at 6 o'clock.
but I've still got to get to home and then get to Furman and then get to Asheville. So I'll be hanging around for a little bit, but when you see me leave, it's got nothing to do with, with wanting to get out of here. I, I have to, well, yeah, I want to get away from Jazzy, but speaking of leadership, I have to go lead a broadcast for Furman basketball tonight. Thank you all for having me.